we've been talking about the many different factors involved in the Sandy Hook shooting that took place a year ago this past December 14th. A disturbing report on the Sandy Hook shooting by the state attorney's office revealed some details into the shooting and the shooter but no wise. It mentioned, among many other things, the shooter's mental health state, his distant relationship with his own family members, even his mother, and an obsession with video games and mass shootings specifically involving children. Today, we talk about the often contentious issue of guns with Jim Wallace, Executive Director of Gun Owners Action League, and Democrat State Representative David Linsky. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me today. We'll start with you, um, State Representative Linsky. 21 states enacted new gun laws to curb, or new laws to curb gun violence in their communities, with eight of those states passing major reforms. This is something that is also happening in Massachusetts on a statewide level. Talk about that. Sure. Um, we've been doing a study and a series of public hearings for the last year on all of the gun laws in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has comparatively strict gun laws already when you compare them to other states. But one thing that we've determined is that there are a lot of loopholes and there's a lot of um, questions about the Massachusetts gun laws and so I expect that the Massachusetts House will take up a comprehensive gun violence prevention legislation piece in January 2014 and so it's it's something that we've determined in the Massachusetts House that is very important to do. Now you're hoping that this will prevent something that happened in Connecticut. You'll pre you're hoping that this will prevent what happened in Connecticut from happening stateside here in Massachusetts. Well, you can't correct? prevent a, a, everything. Okay. But one thing that we do know is that there are a lot of different types of gun violence in this country and, and in Massachusetts and in Connecticut. You've got domestic violence, you've got gang killings, you've got I the occasional mass shootings like that horrible tragedy at, at Sandy Hook. Uh, and you have accidental shootings and you actually more than half the deaths in this country are suicides when you bring in all types of gun violence. Um, I take the position that each one of these different types of incidents requires a different type of solution. We can't eliminate all gun violence, but I honestly believe that if you take a different tact to try to stop each different type of gun violence out there, we can still reduce gun violence about 50%. Okay. Now, going to you, Jim Wallace, and I'm assuming you would disagree or find some disagreement with that, I want to bring up a stat. The Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence and the Brady Campaign ranked Connecticut number two on their list of states with the toughest gun laws in the country. And then they stated that there was only one homicide in the town in the 10 years prior to the school shooting, yet this incident still happened. Like Representative Linsky said, you can't always prevent it. So are these gun measures, though, going to help prevent further ones from happening or at least try to stem that violence of guns being used? Well, certainly one of the things we have a problem with in Massachusetts is that the laws are so convoluted. They're very difficult to understand and very difficult to enforce. And as a matter of fact, since the gun laws, major gun laws were passed in 1998 in Massachusetts, gun crime has actually doubled or tripled depending upon what number you look at in the state. But at the same time, licensed gun ownership has been reduced by over 80%. So we have a huge problem here in Massachusetts. Number one is a, is a rising gun crime rate, regardless of the gun, the gun laws we have in place, and also how lawful gun owners are treated. So we do need to tear apart our gun laws and, and truly reform them and rebuild them so that they're mostly effective against the human criminal element. Are they gonna stop everything? No, I, that's certainly something I agree on with the representative, but we can do better on the laws as far as redrafting them on how we go after the human criminal element and stop the arguments about the thing. What would you say would be the number one purpose behind all of these laws to prevent gun violence? What would you say the number one reason? Is it to keep as many guns out of citizens' hands as possible? Is it to prevent illegal activity from taking place? Is it to... Very simply, it's to keep people safer. And, you know, obviously anytime there's a tragedy of any kind, we feel horrible and we want to make sure that it doesn't happen again. It's a, but tragedies come in all types and a tragedy can include a suicide, it can include an accidental shooting, or it, it can include an, an act of domestic violence. One thing that we've learned is that there's not one solution towards preventing all of the different types out there, that it really requires a comprehensive solution. Um, our first job as uh, members of, uh, of the legislature is to protect the public, and that's simply what we're trying to do here. 
Do you feel that gun laws that have been enacted in the past 10, 15 years have worked? They've been completely ineffective. If you look at How so? if you look at the numbers from our own Massachusetts Department of Public Health, from 1994 to 1998, gun crime was dropping dramatically in the state of Massachusetts. Almost instantaneously, when those gun laws were passed, gun crime started to increase. Gun-related homicides have doubled in the last 15 years. Gun-related assaults have tripled. Uh, aside from gun crime, Massachusetts, according to the FBI reports, has become the most violent state in the Northeast. They have, Massachusetts has a higher violent crime rate than even New York or New Jersey. And 15 years ago, we went after, as a commonwealth, the wrong thing. We went after the items, we went after the licenses, but we did not go after the human criminal element. And that's where we missed. And unfortunately, they've only been thriving since those laws have passed. Do you think that enough is being done to deter criminals from getting hold of the guns? Or do you feel that just in general, guns need to be taken off of the streets as much as possible? I think we need to do both. I, I, Jim's right when he says that we're not doing a great job at law enforcement and, 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 and preventing violent crime and being tough on criminals. I, I think that if you commit a crime with a gun, you should go to jail for a long, long time. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, but one thing that I also know is, is that there are too many people out there who have guns who probably shouldn't have them, or they should think twice before they have them in their own home. And we're really trying to prevent all different types of tragedies here. Um, it, the statistics show that uh, you are many, many times more likely, actually 43 times more likely, if you have a gun in your home, to use that gun on yourself, a family member, or someone close to you, than to ever use that against an intruder. People really have to question whether or not they are truly safer with a gun in your home. I say that you're not safer. You are actually putting yourself and your family at risk with a gun in the home. Do you feel that that's government's job to determine what is safer? Because I guess a lot of people could say this is safer, this is not safe. How, I guess, where is that line, that balance between the citizens' right to privacy and making sure that steps are taken for precaution to keep people safe. Well, you know, and that's a much greater debate. I mean, I could certainly debate what the representative just said about being safer in the home with a gun. I've been around firearms my entire life. I have yet to meet anybody who's been harmed by their own gun. So, you know, that's a huge issue. But when we, when we step that aside, if you look at what society is willing to deal with, let, let's say accidental deaths, for instance, with, with guns. In Massachusetts, on average, there are two accidents, accidental deaths per year with firearms. And we don't even know if those are lawfully owned guns. The same year long, 500 accidental deaths on our highways. So when you look at where a real problem is as far as accidents goes, we're willing to to tolerate 500 accidental deaths on our highways uh, but two accidental deaths with a guns is a major priority. Where any death is certainly an issue, I, I would say they're looking at the wrong thing. And it's also sad because Ma uh, in Massachusetts especially, the government does absolutely nothing to educate the public on gun safety. Matter of fact, the NRA and Gun Owners Action League and our affiliated organizations are the only ones out there teaching gun safety. For the, for the millions and millions of dollars in license fees that we pay into the state, they do nothing, not even a public service announcement on how to safely store a gun. So it's a little bit disingenuous for the government itself to start to tell us how to be safe with our guns. Speaking of licensing, that kind of brings us to the next topic, is that the Massachusetts law states that within 40 days upon receipt of an LTC, which is License to Carry application, the applicant is supposed to be either issued the license or notified in writing of his denial and reason for that. Well, this is not happening, it seems, and some lawsuits have popped up against um, police chiefs and towns regarding this. Do you know why that's happening? Yeah, actually, what is, I, I spoke with the Secretary of Public Safety just a few days ago about that, because if the law is on the books that they need to turn around these applications in 40 days, we need to follow the law, absolutely. There's no excuse for that. Um, what the, public, the, what the secretary told me uh, was this. There was a very serious backlog uh, due to an influx of applications that all came in at the same time. They had some staffing problems. She says that as of this moment, there is no backlog. So that's an, that's an old question right now. Clearly, though, if a local police department isn't doing their part of the job within a quick amount of time, they need to follow the law, too. 
Um, there, and, but as far as the, the state agency portion of it, the backlog's gone right now. Okay. Now, we love to um, get people's reaction, especially on social media with Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. So I invited people to put forward their questions and anything they wanted me to ask you guys. So don't kill the messenger. Just no forwarding <laughs> their questions along. So we've got a couple of good ones, and I think maybe some of them are more um, food for thought as opposed to questions. But let's start with the first one. Um, should videos and movies be outlawed that show gun violence? We'll start with you, Representative. I, you know, um, I, I'm a big First Amendment guy. And so I don't think that you should be outlawing uh, different types of, uh, of media. Uh, people aren't driven to commit crimes by what they see on the media. People need to uh, make their own choices. And obviously, maybe parents need to do a better job supervising their children in, uh, in, in what they're watching. But I don't think that's the answer. Jim, I'll ask you this one. Why can't people just have shotguns for home defense like Vice President Biden called for? Why do they need the high, high capacity um, weapons? I'll be a little bit respectful in that. I, wanna, I won't discuss a firearms advice from the vice president who probably should own a firearm himself. Uh, but, you know, when he talks about just open the back door and fire a couple of shots, it's not very sage advice and it's not very safe advice. Uh, you know, everybody has their own choice. And if you look at the defensive tools that even... Uh, defensive a entities use you, you know what's the one thing they have in common is large capacity magazines whether it's local law enforcement whether it's secret service fbi all those civilian agencies carry large capacity magazines or what gun owners actually call simply a magazine uh, so it's actually a matter of choice as far as what you can use for home defense whether it happens to be a rifle a shotgun or a handgun uh, even the united states supreme court recognizes handguns as some of the most best and most effective self-defense tools in a home. Why should lawful citizens be held to seven rounds when criminals don't play to the same rules? Well, um, actually, um, I, I don't favor lowering the Massachusetts limit down from 10 to, down to seven. The, the governor filed a bill to do that, but my understanding is he's actually backing off uh, that position right now. But I, I, I think that um, we need to do something in restricting the extreme high capacity magazines that are out there. Massachusetts currently has a law in the books that restricts it to 10. Uh, I think that's workable, but there's actually a big loophole in that. And the loophole is this, is that if that magazine was manufactured prior to 1995, even if it has 15, even if it has 20, 94, uh, even if it has 15 or, or 20 capacity in it, it's actually legal. But the problem is, is that there's no effective way to actually tell when a magazine was, was manufactured. It's, it's very, very difficult. So there's a big loophole in there. And, and quite frankly, we need to do all kinds of things in making sure uh, that, that guns are, are, are safer in the, in the way that they're used and the way that they're sold and the way that they're kept. If we have to have car insurance and now health insurance, why shouldn't we have gun insurance? Well, first of all, because you're talking about a, a civil right. You're not talking about a privilege, just like car. Driving a car is a privilege. And uh, certainly that privilege should be... Health care privilege? Excuse me? Would you say having health care is a privilege? Well, health care insurance helps you as the person get cheaper health care. Uh, I don't think gun insurance is going to get me cheaper firearms. Uh, that's what health care insurance is all about. Um, and certainly there is a debate ongoing right now whether... Uh, health care is a civil right or not, but I'm not going to get into that today. Yes, no. <laughs> uh, but one of the problems that we are fighting uh, the insurance for is that there is a very strong movement to use the insurance companies as a way to shut down gun owners. And in, in other words, I have actually been to forums where people have advocated for using the power of the insurance companies to do what these people claim Congress refuses to do. And once you have a private entity that doesn't have to follow the rules uh, of, of basically a constitutional right or the rules going through the legislature, they can make up whatever rules they want. And they can make it as difficult as they want to actually uh, for people to own firearms. And that's just simply unacceptable. And last question. When more people are murdered by knives and hammers, why is it not called knife violence and hammer violence? And why aren't laws being prevented, or why aren't laws being enacted to prevent those? Because uh, you don't cut your stake with a handgun and you don't pound a nail to build a house with a handgun. Um, the utility of knives and hammers uh, is very different than the utility of a handgun. And uh, 
you know, sometimes you have to make a decision based on what's the relative utility of an object about whether or not it should be uh, in common usage or not. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for having a civil debate with me. Jim, Wa Jim Wallace from the Gun Owners Action League and State Representative David Linsky, I appreciate your time. Thank you.